This is Sunday, and the music is happy. It must be time for the Money Hour. This is Harry Brown, and I'm so glad to be back with you again for an hour of discussion about money, the economy, your savings, investments, and in general, what we should do to make sure that our future is safe, secure, bright, and optimistic. And we will be talking about various things today, but you also can help program this show. You can help decide what we're going to talk about by calling 1-800-259-9231 with a question, a comment, a concern, anything on your mind. That's 1-800-259-9231. And... You also can email me. The address is question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org, and Brown has an E on the end of it. All right. Last night on my political show, which airs from 10 to midnight Eastern Time, 7 to 9 on Pacific Coast, and that's on Saturday evenings, Somebody called in and said that he was concerned that the trade deficit was so large now that this was bound to affect the investments in the United States. It was bound to affect the dollar. It was bound to create all kinds of problems. And he brought up the age-old concerns that the Chinese and other governments were holding Treasury securities, and they weren't going to continue to finance this current account deficit that we have. And when they get tired of doing so, then they're going to uh, sell their dollars. They're going to create problems. It's going to create a run on the dollar and a lot of other things. Well, I think that it's important that we discuss this briefly here because this is a constant concern. You may not realize it, but people were saying the same thing in the 1990s. And you may not realize it, but people were saying the same thing in the 1980s. And you may not realize it. Do you know what's coming next? That people were saying the same thing in the 1970s. And I think it's very, very important to realize that when you hear something about some great danger, something that's inevitable, it helps to have a little historical perspective. People are able, investment advisors, investment writers, investment speakers at seminars, are able to make a very compelling case for the inevitability of some event that has to happen. Oh, my God, I've got the facts and figures here. We are at an all-time high in this, and always in the past when that's happened, such and such. And, I mean, they go into this figure and that figure and this information and that information, and they come up with the conclusion that is inescapable and cannot be disputed. But what you don't know when you hear this is that people were saying pretty much the same thing ten years ago that this terrible event had to happen within the next year. And it didn't happen. And it didn't happen the year after that, or the year after that, or the year after that. And you are going to hear all sorts of things like this. Another thing is that the debt in America is just so great. You can't have an economy with this much debt without problems having happening. Well, this too was raised as a a reason that you should get into gold or you should do this or you should do that as long ago as the 1970s. My point is that you just have to learn not to pay too much attention to these people who are shouting that the sky is falling. Now, that doesn't mean that what they are predicting can't come true. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that it may come true, but it may not come true for another 20 or 30 years. It may come true seven years from now. It may come true next year, and it may never come true. The compelling case usually leaves out a number of factors that would tend to offset the things that are in the case. And I don't mean that the person presenting the case is intentionally misleading you by leaving out contrary factors. It's that 
in many cases, his understanding of economics is limited. And so he, too, is being sold a bill of goods by the information that he has uncovered. And he just simply is not able to put it in the context of greater economic understanding and to realize some things that would tend to offset this. <clears throat> and I would like now to discuss one of the factors that tends to offset some of the scare stories that you hear. And that is that the free market always works to correct the problems that are created. And if it's not working to correct those problems, then it usually means that they aren't as bad problems as we thought they were. Uh, take the trade deficit, for instance. One thing that most people don't realize is that the trade deficit is offset precisely dollar for dollar by the amount of capital that's invested in the United States. It has to be because the people who receive those dollars from the United States for goods and services that are supplied from overseas have to do something with those dollars. They will either leave them in savings accounts or CDs in the United States, or they'll buy treasury securities with them, or they'll buy stocks, or they'll do something else, or they will sell the dollars to someone in exchange for another currency, and the someone they sell the dollars to will then have to leave the dollars in the United States in the form of savings accounts, treasury securities, stocks, and so on. The point is that every dollar that is supposedly held around the world, except for the actual cash that's in somebody's pocket, every dollar held around the world is actually held in the United States, in a bank or a brokerage or someplace. The dollars are used in the United States because that's the place where the dollars uh, serve as a medium of exchange. Now, the point is that when the trade deficit gets to be too large, then people will simply not invest more money in the United States, <clears throat> and one of two things will have to happen. One is that the dollar will begin to sink to make the dollars more attractive, meaning that somebody using a foreign currency could get more dollars for any unit of currency that he has, and that makes the investments in the United States more attractive. Or they may just simply slack off on the investments, and that will, in effect, uh, offset the trade deficit, meaning that the trade deficit will have to begin to shrink because it's not being financed. But the market will take care of it. One way or another, the market will take care of it. It's the same thing with debt in the United States. When people get to the point that their debt levels are too high, then other people won't lend money to them anymore because the other people, the lenders, are not masochists. And even companies like Citibank or Capital One or others who are really big in the credit card business will just stop issuing credit cards to people uh, based on the amount of debt that they have, and the debt levels will begin to shrink. The market will take care of it one way or another. Now, there are some things that are not affected by the market, but are affected by the government itself. And we can discuss some of those things because they throw monkey wrenches in the market, and there, therein lie the opportunities to capitalize on investments that are affected by what the government is doing. We'll talk about those when we come back. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. This is Harry Brown. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy-five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, 
Here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Failsafe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and this is The Money Show. And if you've got a comment or a question or criticism or want to collect a bill, just call me at 1-800-259-9231. That's 1-800-259-9231. Now, what I was saying before is that the free market is self-regulating, and that is that it tends to swing back and forth one way or another to correct problems. But it does it on a gradual basis. The nice part about free market regulation is that it's not sudden, it's not uh, abrupt, it is not devastating. It just takes place naturally. When debt gets to be too high, then uh, lenders stop lending money, but they don't do it all at once on one day and suddenly cut everybody off. It happens gradually as different people in the marketplace begin to take steps. The same thing is true about a trade deficit. It's true about anything else. The one area where things happen abruptly and the one area in which things happen that can be devastating to people in the market is the government because the government is not a natural institution. The government doesn't work. The people in the government don't work with their own money. They don't come to decisions, and and the government is one agency that affects everybody, whereas in the lending market, for instance, you've got a whole host of lenders of different people who come to different decisions at different times, and they don't usually do things abruptly. If they are going to stop lending money because the level of debt seems to be getting too high, they will do it gradually. They will phase out, and they also do it on a person, uh, a case-by-case basis. That is, they'll stop lending money to people who uh, don't qualify on the basis of this level. And so they are cutting those people off, but other people are still receiving new loans, new credit cards, whatever it is. But then they, at a future date, they may change the level and make it a little more stringent and a little more stringent and so forth. So these things happen gradually. Uh, and they happen with different lenders at different times. But when the government acts, it acts and affects the entire market all at once, and everything is abrupt. And, of course, the one agency of the government that has the biggest effect on the investment markets and other areas of finance is the Federal Reserve System. And it's the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, a group of people who are largely appointed by the government, and especially the chairman who is appointed by the president, uh, these people make decisions and suddenly everything is different. Suddenly conditions aren't the same as they were last week or the week before. Things are not generally done gradually, but even more important, what they do affects everybody rather than just a small segment of the market. They, in effect, are not competing with other people doing the same thing the way lenders are competing with each other. And other people in other businesses are competing with people who are in the same industry or the same service group or whatever it may be. So suddenly the Federal Reserve changes its policy and everything changes. And, of course, the main thing that the Federal Reserve does is determine how much new money will flow into circulation today, tomorrow, next week, and so on. We usually hear about the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates at a certain level or lowering the discount rate or doing this or doing that, but the main function of the Federal Reserve is to, in effect, print new money. It doesn't actually print the the money. What it does is it just gives credits to banks in the marketplace, credits that they did not have before. 
uh, it might be well to explain how it is that the money comes into circulation. What happens is that the New York Federal Reserve Bank, which acts on behalf of the Board of Governors of the entire Federal Reserve System, the New York Federal Reserve Bank, one of 12 Federal Reserve Banks around the country, uh, has what's called the Open Market Desk, and they will go into the market, and if they want to add uh, new money into circulation, what they'll do is they'll buy some Treasury securities. Uh, you know, you might go into the market and buy $10,000, or you might buy a $1,000 T-bill. They will go into the market, and they might buy a billion dollars worth of Treasury securities, or half a billion, or a hundred million, or some figure that's far bigger than we can really wrap our little minds around. But when they do this, they buy it from a bond dealer in the marketplace, and that bond dealer might be, say, the Bank of America. And when it buys these securities from the Bank of America, what happens is it credits the Bank of America with a certain amount of money for the securities. Uh, the Bank of America has an account at a Federal Reserve Bank, and the Federal Reserve System credits $100 million to the Bank of America. It's just created this out of thin air, but it does so. And it then takes possession of the securities. The Federal Reserve uh, Bank does. So the Federal Reserve System now owns these Treasury securities, and the Bank of America has $100 million that didn't exist 10 minutes ago. This is the way the money comes into circulation. And, of course, what the Fed is doing on any given day is dealing with a number of bond dealers and buying Treasury securities from a whole bunch of different people, feeding new money into the marketplace. And... When it wants to cut back, what it does is it goes into the marketplace and sells treasury securities. And when those securities are bought by a bond dealer, then the, the bond dealer loses a certain amount of credit at the Federal Reserve Bank. It may have an account there that was a billion dollars. And if it buys $100 million worth of securities, then its account is reduced from a billion to $900 million. And, of course, the bank is capable of taking money out of that account or adding to it because it's just like a bank account that you or I have. The only difference is that because of the deposits that the bank has, it is required to keep a certain level in the Federal Reserve Bank, and that is the bank's reserve. The reserve it has to keep in order to be able to meet sudden withdrawals and other situations, and it is also a way by which the Federal Reserve System regulates the amount of credit that banks can provide to people. Well, I think you get the point. There is further ways that money is created and not uh, or taken out of circulation that the banks do, but this is under the supervision of the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, my point is this, that the Federal Reserve will go along shooting money into circulation and then suddenly one day become horrified by the fact that inflation is creeping up. That inflation, which had been 1 or 2%, is now 4% or 3 or 4%, and so they have to do something. And unlike the people in the marketplace who do it gradually, the Fed will slam on the brakes, suddenly dump billions of dollars worth of Treasury securities on the market, and to coin an expression, all hell breaks loose. Well, we'll continue this, and we'll listen to your questions at 1-800-259-9231. When we come back, this is Harry Brown. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession, with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. 
Go to libertyfree.com to see a sample chapter of Fail Safe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's libertyfree.com. All right, quit dancing, sit down, and let's get back to business here. This is Harry Brown. And to wind up this discussion about the free market regulation and federal regulation or government regulation, what we see here is that when the government does something, it happens all at once, and it's very abrupt. And when the free market regulates something, it does it gradually and does it tenderly. Uh, sensitively and in a way that does not cause gradu- uh, does not cause abrupt changes. So, in addition to being a plea for good regulation in the free market and getting rid of bad regulation in the government sector, the point of this is that you don't get very far acting on. Scare stories that say that things that are happening in the free market, such as the trade deficit or the amount of debt, the two examples that I've given, are going to cause big, big problems in the near future because they generally don't do so. They generally correct themselves gradually. The one area where you could look to find changes that might have profound effects upon the market is to government policy and especially Federal Reserve policy. But... There's a small problem with that. You know and I know that Fed actions, the Federal Reserve policy changes, are going to affect the market. But so does practically everybody else in the market know that. And they're watching it too. So when the Fed does make abrupt changes, the market reacts immediately and you cannot get in quickly enough to take advantage of it. The only time you can make money speculating, that is beating the market, the only time you can do that is not when you have information that other people don't have, but when you interpret the information differently from the way that other people do. When other people look at something that has happened and say, ah, this is A and it's going to lead to B, and you look at it and you say, ah, I understand this differently. I have a better grasp on how the economics of this works, and I realize that in this case, A is going to lead to E. And therefore, the market is creating an opportunity for me to buy something unusually cheaply that is going to go up considerably in price, or vice versa, is going to sink considerably in price. It is not the information you have. It is how you interpret the information. Because generally speaking, the only information that's really worth anything is available to the market as a whole. And this is one reason, just one, just one small reason, that the whole brouhaha about insider trading is so meaningless. I have to tell you, I've been in the investment markets for much, much longer than I like to admit because it tends to reveal my age. But when I was really flying high in the 70s, and I had a book, for instance, that was number one on the New York Times bestseller list and sold well over 200,000 copies in hardcover, and I was a well-known investment writer, uh, I had a newsletter, I spoke at conferences and so on, people would come to me, people would talk to me, who probably wouldn't answer my phone calls now, but... In those days, uh, people uh, very often approached me about different things. And one of the things they approached me about frequently was inside information that they had on something. And they would let me in on this if I, in turn, would do something for them. Well, I never acted on any of this inside information, but I always made a note of it that this particular stock was due to go up double, triple over the next year, whatever it is, and I'd always make a note of these things, and it would turn out that none of it 
None of it. Not one of these inside tips ever produced the results that had been touted for them. And I've just got to tell you the best insider trading story that I know. And that is that a dear friend of mine, a fellow named Gordon McLendon, who has since passed on, who was a very wealthy fellow, he owned a number of radio stations in Texas and Oklahoma, and uh, he read my book in 1970, and he got all excited about getting into gold, and he went to Switzerland. Uh, at this time, gold was around $35 an ounce, uh, and uh, it had been held there for many, many years, since 1933, by first the Roosevelt administration and then succeeding administrations that kept gold pegged at $35. So Gordon went to Switzerland and he spoke to the chief gold trader at the Union Bank of Switzerland. There were three big banks in Switzerland, the Union Bank of Switzerland, the Swiss Bank Corporation, and Swiss Credit Bank. And these three banks had what you would call a gold pool. They tended to set the price of gold every morning and determine how they would handle transactions that had come in overnight from their customers. There was a similar gold pool in England, and they tended to act in concert with each other, the English and the Swiss gold pools. All right, so Gordon goes in, and he says, I want to buy a bunch of gold. And he's talking to the top man there in the gold department at the Union Bank of Switzerland. And the gold trader said, why do you want to buy so much gold? And Gordon said, well, because I think that the United States dollar is in trouble, I think this, I think that, and I think the price of gold is going to have to go up. And it's been pegged for so long, it's underpriced, so that when it does go up, it's going to go up a whole bunch. And the gold trader said, well, you know, gold's at $35, and it could rise. Uh, it might go up to 37 it might go up to 38 it might even go up to $39, but it's not going to go to $70 or $100 or anything of that sort. It just isn't ever going to go over $40. And Gordon said, how can you be so sure that gold is never going to go over $40? And the gold trader said, because we control the market. Now, talk about being able to talk to somebody on the inside and get inside information. Here's a man who says, because we control the market, I can tell you that gold will never go over $40 an ounce. And you know what? Three years later, it was at $100. And 10 years later, it was at $800. So it didn't matter whether the gold trader was part of a pool that <clears throat> controls the market. He couldn't control the market because when the free market is ready to do something, there's no one that can stop it. And even when governments try to stand in the way of it, the free market finds a way of going around, and circumventing the government policy, and it just simply may create a different circumstance from what it would have otherwise, but the free market will not be denied. This is Harry Brown. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Welcome back, Harry Brown here. And to wrap this up, I got to, on a diversion there about insider trading. Uh, let's wrap up the insider trading part first, and let me emphasize once again that it is not the information that you get. It is how you interpret the information. It is whether or not you see something in that information that other people in the market in general don't seem to be seeing. If so, and if you're right, then you have a chance to capitalize on that and make money speculating on that particular 
information uh, on the investment that is concerned by that information. But just simply having insider information is really worthless. Even that Martha Stewart case, you know, she sold her Imcone stock, and that stock is at a higher price now today than it was when she sold. And, in fact, uh, the information that was given was not particularly valuable. The information was that the FC, uh, pardon me, the um, FDA was not going to approve the stock. And as I under, uh, I'm sorry, not F, the FDA was not going to approve the drug that Imclone was developing and that Martha Stewart owned stock in Imclone. And the idea was that the founder of the company was selling stock on this inside information and the broker supposedly told Martha Stewart that this was the case and so Martha Stewart dumped her stock. Uh, We don't know that that's true. The evidence for all of this was very, very shaky. And Martha Stewart, of all people, should not be in prison today. But The point is that even the founder of the company was acting simply on a rumor. And as it turns out, the uh, device, the process that was involved was approved eventually, and the result was that the information was really meaningless at the time because it was very, very temporary. And the stock really didn't go down that much on the selling anyway. Uh, So the point is that insider information is not valuable. Now this brings us back then to the central point, and that is that the only abrupt changes on which you can capitalize are those made by the government. And whatever information comes from the government, such as new Federal Reserve policy, is going to be known to everybody else in the market. So the mere fact that there has been a change in policy is not going to be something you can capitalize on because by the time you get your order into the market, the market will already have adjusted the price to take that into consideration. And the amount that you can make, the the profit that you can make, is going to be rather slim. But if it turns out that you and the rest of the market have interpreted this wrongly, then the amount you could lose could be very, very great. So you're betting a lot to try to gain a little. But... If the market sees it one way and you see it another way, well, then you let the market adjust the price, and when the price is adjusted, then you move in, either to buy or to sell short, uh, because now the market has swung the price a long way in one direction, and you think it's like a rubber band that it's going to have to snap backward. You may be right or wrong, but at least you are speculating intelligently whether or not it turns out to be right or wrong. I think that with a speculation, it's wise always to have a stop-loss order in. That is an order that says if the price goes X number of dollars or X percentage against what you expect it to do, then the broker will automatically dump the investment for you and get you out of it so that you can limit the amount that you can lose. And in that case, then, by the market having swung in the wrong direction and you having then gotten in, you have the hope of making a large profit, and the stop loss makes sure that if you lose, the loss is going to be fairly small. So, uh, there we are. Don't get excited by the scare stories that people tell you, because, number one, these stories may have been circulating for years and years and have not yet come to fruition. Number two, if there is an adjustment coming and it's something in the market rather than by government, then the adjustment will be slow and steady and gradual, and it's not going to be something you can suddenly make money on. And uh, so uh, I hope that this has been helpful. What I think you should do, of course, with the money that's precious to you, is to have a balanced and diversified portfolio. Uh, My portfolio is 25% in stocks, 25% in bonds, 25% in gold, and 25% in cash. And when the market prices push these uh, percentages too far away from 25%, meaning that some investment has risen to 35% of the portfolio and, or maybe some investment has fallen to 15%, at those limits I will rebalance the portfolio by selling the winners and buying some more of the losers and getting them all back to 25%. This has served me well for 30 years. 
and it has produced a uh, an average gain of 9% a year with only four losing years in that 30 years, the worst loss being 6%. And that brings me to a question that came in from Gary in Hawaii saying, I've checked the results for the Permanent Portfolio Fund, PRPFX is the symbol, and the results are different from what you say. Well, that's a mutual fund that uses this principle, but it doesn't use the same percentages that I just outlined to you. And so it's gotten a little different result, but it also has done very, very well, and it is a simple way to invest uh, in a balanced portfolio, you can do it for as little as a thousand dollars. The symbol again, PRPFX, the Permanent Portfolio Fund, and I am a consultant to that fund, so I do have a vested interest in it. This is Harry Brown. We'll be back in a minute. This is Harry Brown. You've worked too hard for your savings to risk them on somebody's grand plan to double them. Wouldn't you rather have a safe, secure portfolio, one that grows steadily each year without the wide swings in the investment markets? For 25 years, I've shown people how to have such a portfolio, one that made money the past few years rather than losing heavily. Now you can get that same help from my book, Fail Safe Investing. You can have that secure, bulletproof portfolio. You can download Failsafe Investing at LibertyFree.com for only $9.75. Then read it on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. The book can give you the security you crave without becoming a speculator or a market whiz. Go to LibertyFree.com to read a sample chapter and then start protecting your savings. Failsafe Investing can be yours tonight at LibertyFree.com. Well, welcome back, and this is the final segment, so let me begin by thanking you for tuning in today. I appreciate the fact that I'm allowed to talk with you every Sunday, and I appreciate Genesis Communication Network making this available, and also John Harmon, who's in the booth in Minnesota taking care of everything and making sure that we stay on the air despite the frog in my throat and despite everything else. One last note today, you know, we had an election this past week. I don't, you may not have been paying attention, but there was an election between, um, oh gosh, I can never remember the names of the people, but uh, I don't know, it was uh, somebody named Cush and somebody else named Barry or something like that. And a lot of people are thinking, well, now with Bush reelected, this is going to create a stock market rally. Well, the idea that this is going to create a rally in the stock market flies in the face of uh, another theory that has existed in the markets for 30 years or so, people have been saying, and that is that just after election, a stock market, the stock market will go down the first year of a new term because the incumbent wants to get a recession out of the way. They, they, they want to get all the bad news taken care of then when it isn't going to affect a future election. But then in the final year, before the next election, they, the stock market will go up and do very, very well because they will be doing everything to stimulate the economy at that time and so forth and so on. And that this conspiratorial attitude by the politicians in power uh, creates opportunities because then you know when to buy and sell. Well, I don't pay that much attention to day-to-day -day movements in the stock market, but it seems to me that we haven't had much of a rally in the stock market this year. As a matter of fact, the market dipped down below 10,000 before it finally came back a little, just before the election and just after the election. And I think that whatever rally we're having right now is probably just a little bit of a euphoria on the part of some traders who think that George Bush is going to be good for the economy, but it's probably not going to go very far. And my point here, of course, is that all these theories about when to buy and when to sell based on historical 
evidence of what governments do and what governments are likely to do and so forth and so on usually doesn't work out very, very well. The stock market will go its own way, and it is tied to prosperity in America, so if you're going to have stocks in the portfolio that contains the money that's precious to you, then you also need some countervailing investments, bonds which profit when interest rates go down, which also helps in prosperity but would help in a deflation. You certainly need gold, which will help you in an inflation, and you need cash, which will help to cushion any changes. Well, this is Harry Brown. Thanks again for listening. I'll be back here next week at this time. I hope you have a good week, and I hope you take care of your savings in a prudent way. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye.